One thing I did want to say is, um, where's Dane? Where are you? Uh, Dane came in today and forgot to bring any money in. So he has no money and he's trapped at uni forever. However, he did manage, I don't know how, it's a long story, to get a very icy cold can of Sprite. And he's wondering if he can start uh, some sort of long barter chain and get home eventually. Or end up with a Mercedes or something like that. <laughs> and he would like to know if anyone would be interested in starting off helping him by swapping the Sprite for something else or some money. You prefer something else, I assume. How much does he need to get home? How much do you need to get home? Um, well, assuming I, don't, uh, I can get on there, so it's something like four dollars. Four bucks. Four. So you see, he's going to be going uphill, but I reckon he can do it. Because this costs us, but does someone want to swap? Someone's been really thirsty now. And then, yes, yes, what do you want to offer him? To, no, you've got to offer him something. That he can swap. What? Oh, that's really cool, but I feel really bad that you didn't get it now. So I, I will bring you one tomorrow and you can buy it off me. Thank you. Well done. So the travel tent's cool. Is it a real travel tent? Yeah. Oh, awesome. So you have an extra journey left. Yeah. You can come back tomorrow and be stuck here again. <laughs> On a number of journeys. <laughs> okay. All right. Well done. So, professionalism. You guys, when you leave here, you've probably heard it a million times. You can go if you need to go. That's cool. Um, to, remember, this week's lectures are really just about stuff that... We don't normally talk about it at uni, and it's going to affect you a lot when you leave, and I think we should think about it sometime before we leave, so we're going to talk about it now. When you leave, you're going to be what people call professionals. You will be a professional, and you've probably heard the word professional used so many times now, that it's probably devoid of all meaning to you. You could be excluded, Matt, yeah, you could be excluded from uni, and not become a professional. What does professional mean? Who wants to tell me what being a professional means? Yes? You mean to get paid to do what you do? Oh, uh, yeah, that's sort of like a uh, job. Yeah, like the word professional, I mean, professional has many meanings. Uh, you mean versus amateur or something. What I'm thinking is, um, in the sense that someone would probably say a shopkeeper isn't a professional, but a doctor is a professional. Uh, uh, you know, people would say this. People would say an engineer is a professional, but um, uh, the postman is not a professional. So what do we mean? So when in surveys, when they classify people's responses by their em uh, employment code, they'd be, are you a professional, or are you something, or something, or something. Or something. So what do we mean by professionals? Because you're probably all going to be professionals. Yes? I've got a kind of weird definition. Based on medieval times, when you have a doctor in a village, and you go and treat people for free, but in return, the people would give you things that you need to live, like oh. Did you hear this? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very a topical thing. So he's thinking in the old days there was like a village and maybe there'd be one doctor looking after the village. I don't know if it's true or just in the movies. And, and, uh, and maybe the people wouldn't have enough money to pay the doctor so they'd give him things he needs. And in fact, uh, my father-in-law is in fact a doctor and he lives in a fairly poor area and he treats people and if they don't have money, he treats them for free and every now and then he wakes up and outside his door is a bag of potatoes or a, a chook or something, you know, from some shy person that doesn't want to say anything, but it's very grateful because he saved their life and so much. So yeah, uh, and also, or uh, they leave travel tents or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a job where you're responsible for something. Yeah, a job where you're responsible for something that happens to someone else is, um, is a very good way of putting it. Though people would probably say, um, I'm trying to think like accountants are professional. <laughs> but, no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Can I give you shh, 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 shh? A professional is someone who belongs to a profession. <laughs> Thank you. And, no, there's more. When you're a normal person in a normal job, <laughs> they're not normal. <laughs> who, do you, who do you have a responsibility to? Your boss and yourself. Who calls the shots in the job? Your boss. When you're a professional, you belong to a profession, and you have a responsibility 
to your profession, which is a bit weird. And that is independent and often at odds with your duty to your boss. So for example, if you're an auditor and you go in and audit a company, the company will be paying you to audit them. They are going to hope that you say everything's okay. If you say everything, oh, I, I know, you go to get a pink slip on your car. And you really hope the guy giving you the pink slip on the car, the insurance, is going to say your car passes rego. And if you found someone who was shonky, who would always say it passes rego, even when you need a new tire and stuff like that, maybe you keep going back to them every year. And maybe that person figures they'll get a lot of business by perhaps giving pink slips when they shouldn't, because people will go there. That person, if they had that point of view, would really be just thinking about the relationship of them with their client, with the customer. But a professional thinks, bugger, someone's paying me to do this, but actually what I've got to do is not what they want me to do. So an auditor would still say, I'm sorry, ba -ba you fail, I'm going to have to call in the police. Thanks for paying me, by the way. <laughs> yes, this, this is what we call being a professional. A professional is someone who has a professional responsibility. Now, when you leave uni, you will join some professional body. So if you're an engineer, you will join Engineers Australia. If you're an accountant, you'll join there's some professional body for accounts. If you're uh, an actor, you join a professional actuarial body. If you're uh, a doctor, you'll join the AMA. This is your profession. And you have a duty to your profession. And although the person paying you might want you to do something else, you have this thing we call professional responsibility. So you guys are all going to go out and you're going to be engineers or computer programmers. What's your professional responsibility and how's it going to differ from what your employer necessarily would want you to do that. Okay, yeah, you're running software for the Australian tax office. <laughs> they need it out by a certain date or the minutes are going to look bad. Your boss says, for heaven's sake, just get it right. And you're saying, actually, it's a bit funny with this particular deduction. We haven't got the software giving the right deduction to people. And he goes, does it over or under quote? And you go, oh, well, it under quotes. So they end up paying too much tax. He goes, it's fine, just put it in. <laughs> As a professional, in addition to the duty to your boss, you also have a duty to do the right thing. And you would say, uh, actually, no, I can't do that. Sorry. In computing, it's not really clear, is it? It's not, it's, uh, someone told me in a tube that people are having trouble coming up with ethical dilemmas they're going to face when they leave now, here now and go into the work. I thought, isn't that odd? Because you guys are going to be hit with so many ethical dilemmas but they're not the sort you see in TV or on movies, so you just can't even imagine them. And the best you can come up with is copying software or something like that. And that's just so far removed from the ethical dilemmas you're all going to be hit with. I really think you should think about them before you get hit with them. So let me tell you some that would normally affect an engineer. Let's just talk about engineers in, in general, and then we'll see how that relates to computer engineers or software engineers, and if you're, or if you're a computer scientist, how it will relate to you. An engineer would say, suppose I'm employed as a structural engineer, to certify the plans for a bridge. And a large construction company like Mervac or someone like that is paying me to certify these plans. What is Mervac's chief objective? Make money. make money. They're legally required to make money. Is their chief objective to do a beautiful bridge? No. They are happy to do a beautiful bridge if it means it gets some money, so they get more bridge contracts in the future, people are really happy and then people employ them a lot, or people pay them more money because it's beautiful. Any reason, but if they make a beautiful bridge just for the sake of making a beautiful bridge, and it doesn't make them any more money, well, they could actually be sued by their shareholders. Microsoft, <laughs> company we make a lot of fun of, why do computer scientists everywhere dislike Microsoft? Because they're not evil. They're actually obeying the law. What's Microsoft's duty? To make money. Is their duty to write good code? No. Is their duty to write safe code? No. Is their duty to encourage safe coding practices? No. Is their duty to improve the world? No. In fact, they make more money if they disimprove the world in certain ways. Yeah, if they lock people out of standards, if they manage to hold monopolies, if they manage to undermine Java or open source stuff, any attacks they do which diminish the global good actually increase their profit margin, they're required to do it. They're not evil, they're just behaving rationally as they're supposed to behave. They're supposed to make lots of money. Although, yes? The Labor Laws are getting the European Union, and the United States has really crazy laws which allow them to yes. monopolize the market. 
Yes. Well, yes, they are getting sued in the European. In fact, I think at the moment they're down to a fine yeah. for not paying their last fine or something funny like that. <laughs> but the amounts they're being sued isn't, uh, you know, isn't enough to give us the happiness inside we want. But they're not following the law either. Oh yeah, I mean their job is really, if we want to be really precise, to break the law as much as they can and still make money. Yeah, if you can break the law a little bit and still make money, well, then I don't know, maybe it's your duty to do that. I mean, so AWB, all those other companies, they're out there breaking the law, thinking they're going to make money breaking the law. Yes? Aren't the corporations that are part of responsibility to shareholders under the Corporations Act negated by any other laws that pass? So that by going for certain things like AWB selling things, for example, saying it's yes. something they really shouldn't be doing, it's not something that they can be sued for. It's more something that the directors on the board are doing in order to get rid of that debt to get paid out. Look, yes, it is, it is uh, tricky, and I've got to say, we're now steering away from an area in which I know anything. So, yeah. so I, don't, I certainly don't know the precise obligations on a company under the Corporations Act, or the precedence of other law and how that interacts with the Corporations Act. And I don't know, and the Trade Practices Act I know a bit more about, but, but I do know, I do know, without going into all those details, that the company's bottom line is to make money, and that's what they're supposed to do. That's their whole objective. And if they don't make money, they're not doing the right thing. Cheaper, faster, better. Well, not even cheaper, faster, better. Just more money, more money, more money. And if cheaper, faster, better gives them more money, that's good. And if slower, crappier, and people locked in gives them more money, that's what they'll do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? Does that mean an undertaker should go around killing people? Yeah. I, I don't want to give anyone tips, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be living near an undertaker's house. <laughs> No, no, I mean, everyone has, individual people have a duty to the law. The problem is corporations um, uh, have, have a, uh, uh, you know, have this property that they're, you know, grabbing some of their funds. Okay, now, why are we saying all this stuff? Because you'll be employed by a company or a boss or someone or someone or someone, and their objective will differ from yours necessarily, because their objective, unless you're extraordinarily uh, fortunate, their objective will be really be to make lots of money. Now, Often you can make lots of money by doing the right thing and making good software and da 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 But sometimes the easy path to making lots of money conflicts with the path to doing the right thing. And as a professional, we have a duty. So, I'm working for Mervac. Mervac are building a bridge. I say, I'm not sure. You've got one pylon. I think it needs two pylons. They go, every pylon is $100 million, Mr. Buckland. Are you sure we need two? I go, ah, you might need one, you might need two. I think you probably need two. And I go, a hundred million dollars, Mr. Buckland. We've got another job we're about to quote for in a week. Would you like to be the structural engineer on that? There's a, a million dollar fee for someone to, oh, well, maybe you can get away with one pylon if uh, you put a sign at the beginning saying only one truck allowed on at any time. You know, so basically, as a structural engineer, you have a duty to the, your profession is, is you have a duty to your profession, and your profession has a duty to society. So your duty is to build a bridge and it'll work. So you would actually say, bugger you, I'm sorry, it needs two pylons. And if you do otherwise, you're doing the wrong thing. Now I remember years ago, you guys may or may not remember it. Actually, you probably weren't even born. There was a big thunderstorm down the south coast. And a lot of, down where they do all that coal mining, around Coaldale and Coal Cliff, you know, down south there's a lot of landslip and structural weakness in that area, and they've mined it a little bit too much, so it's not completely safe. It's on a really steep escarpment of soil that's not really quite friable and gives way a bit. There was a lot of water, more than they had cultivates to deal with, and a lot of whooshing and mud flowed down, and, and something terrible happened to the train line. Do you remember that? I can't remember the details, but there was an accident because of mud slippage and stuff like that, and the train, and someone died, and it was a terrible accident. And I remember following with real interest the interviews with the engineer, some poor old bloke who was a structural engineer, who would certified that the bridge was okay. And it wasn't okay. And, and it was just so sad because he was this lovely old guy who was you know, perhaps a bit out of his depth and he had family and kids and he was saying, oh yeah, but you know, we always make bridges like that and everyone told me it would be okay. And he had all these other reasons why it was okay for him to certify it was okay, even though technically if you looked at the evidence in the cold hard light of day, that bridge was not built quite exactly right or the cultivates weren't exactly, there was some problem. And he went down, I'm pretty sure he went to jail. And all the time you can think, gee, what a poor guy, and he thought he was doing the right thing and he was doing what his employer expected and everyone around him assumed he'd just sign it off would cause an enormous ruckus if he hadn't and all sorts of things. But, but he sort of did the wrong thing. Now, let me give you some other examples of that. Um, as, uh, well, I'm just going to do it really quick. Uh, Arthur Anderson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> has any, does anyone remember Arthur Anderson? Yeah. Big accounting firm. 
did a couple of odd things, but the oddest of them all was they were advisors to a large corporation in America called Enron. 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 Oh, they were the auditors. I don't think they were the advisors. Is that right? Does anyone remember the details? They were the auditors. And Enron was doing shonky, shonky stuff. And Arthur Anderson was paid to audit them and check that they were doing the right stuff. And Arthur Anderson, with a wink and a nod, kept saying, yeah, everything's all right. Everything's all right. Because they were getting hefty fees from Enron. And if they'd blown the whistle on it, they wouldn't have got those hefty fees. So although they were supposed to be independent auditors with a duty to the society, blah, 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 they kept on going. Enron got worse and worse. And when Enron collapsed, it was really the end of the world for a lot of people. People lost their jobs, their savings. There are people now who have retired who don't have money to live on. People lost their houses. Um, it affected builders. It probably affected lots of people you know. The HIH crash swept around the world, causing untold misery. And some greedy bastards at Arthur Anderson could have stopped it being that big if they'd acted much earlier. But they didn't because they... And what happened to Arthur Anderson? This is the happy part of that story. It's gone. <laughs> There's no Arthur Anderson anymore. It's disappeared from the face of the world. Well, it's not completely gone? They're pretty much just renamed. Ah, oh, curses! 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 <laughs> Those evil, clever people. Okay, what are they called now? We're not Arthur Anderson. <laughs> I can't believe it's not Arthur Anderson. <laughs> okay, well, I hope they're not going to sue me. When I said Arthur Anderson, I was referring to Neo. Okay. Uh, so other examples are NASA. Now, NASA's a classic one, because I think we've mentioned the space shuttles before. The space shuttles are very dangerous vehicles because they have what we call safety critical components. And a safety critical component, have I told you this already? It's a big exploding fuel tank. Safety critical thing is something where if one thing goes wrong, you're stuck. So if you build your software correctly and you design your systems right, you're an engineer, you're building a bridge. You design it so if this fails, you talk of, it's, there's failure modes and failure mods, you know about this? So if it fails, it will fail in this particular way. So if the concrete fails, the reinforcing will help. If the reinforcing fails, the concrete will help. If this bit slips, that pile will move a bit, counteracting the force rather than adding to the force, causing the slip and stabilise it. If this lift gives way, this brake will swing into action. You have all these things, so if one thing fails, something else looks after it. A, a safety critical component is if that thing fails, you're stuck. That's, that's it, it's the end of the story. And the space shuttle is often called the most dangerous vehicle in the world because it has something like a thousand safety critical components. So things that, if something goes wrong, or some, I'm making the number up, but it was like that order of magnitude. Some, uh, uh, who was telling me that? It was, I was listening to him, I wasn't being the face to face. I think it was like the second guy that landed on the moon, the guy that's not Neil Armstrong. <laughs> I can't believe it's not Neil Armstrong said that. <laughs> but is that Buzz Aldrin? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I heard him being interviewed saying that. Um, okay. So, the Challenger. Uh, shall we do the Challenger? Okay, let's start with the Challenger. Who knows the story of the Challenger? Let's, let's have a look at the Challenger. Hang on, let's have a look at him. I've got him here. Columbia was more recent. You can't see? Oh, yeah, give you a screen. Here we are. We get to see... Uh, this is the NASA... Um, NASA's blurb on it. I used to have a movie taken by a lady who was just watching it when it happened. She just had the camera and she was chatting to a friend, just tracing as it went up. And, it, and then it, yeah, it was quite, it's actually a frightening video. It, it just, you hear everyone around go, and it's just like, you see the spectators, it's just quite absolutely astonishing. Here's the NASA video that they were making. Here's the astronauts going, yeah, I'm pretty sure there was a teacher. One of them was a teacher. Is she like a kindy teacher or something like that? This is them all lining up to go into it. Just move forward a bit, let's go again. Get a chat about it all. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Just go a bit. Come on again. Oops, here we go.
So, um, let's just make that a bit higher. Uh, NASA, ooh, NASA had, um, had been under a lot of pressure to cut funds. And they had a lot of safety work they used to do, checking everything was okay and safe. And they started to outsource a lot. There's a big investigation after this crash to work out, after this disaster, not crash, to work out what had happened. Um, Uh, I, don't, I guess I don't want to say too much about it. Suffice to say, Richard Feynman, who I've already mentioned to you, was one of the people involved in the investigation, and that's the one bright sort of part about it. He was involved in the investigation, and everyone was just saying it's this, it's that. And I guess it, people at NASA sort of felt that it was a genuine drop in the quality of the safety checks at NASA and the engineering standards at NASA, and outsourcing of stuff was a bad thing, and their old high standards, which were very expensive, should have been followed, and outsourcing wasn't such a good idea. Richard Feynman um, produced a minority report, and he was sort of shouted down by everyone else. He was just put on as like a token scientist and a whole lot of like bureaucrats were just on the panel investigating. But he decided he would take it seriously. He was a brilliant man and he set out to learn exactly what happened. And he visited the factories where the components that made were built. He, looked, he talked to everyone at NASA he could find. He looked at all the footage. He just went around investigating. He didn't know anything about spaceships. He's like he's a nuclear physicist. But he's just wandering around. He's just asking questions. And he's a clever guy and he's not accepting no for an answer. And he has a theory as to what caused it. And he was sort of shut up and people produced uh, the main report, sort of whitewashing everything. And he had this like little minority report. You can read about it in his book, actually. And, um, but he sort of turned the tables because he was a really clever guy. And at a press conference, he, he, um, people were saying, why are you disagreeing? Why are you dissenting? Why? And he got an O-ring. He thinks an O-ring final. And he got an O-ring. He just put it in a glass of cold water because it was unusually cold that morning. And O-rings made of rubber have certain properties. They're supposed to seal things. That seal failed. And um, he put it in the glass of water. And you can see the footage on the internet of him doing it. And after he took it out, the, the, the ring failed. And it was just in front of everyone. They were filming. It was just Everyone, that's the problem. So, um, so that was pretty amazing. So you'd think they'd be okay. Uh, that was uh, what, 90-something? Six, seven, eight, nine? Does anyone know when Challenger was? 80s. 80s. Was it? No. 90-something. No. Late 90s. Yeah. 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 Look at the heck. 1977. <laughs> <laughs> um, 19 uh, and then what happened next? Did NASA go back and change all their safety standards and tied everything up and everything was really safe? No way. What do we have next? The Columbia disaster. The Columbia was, uh, they think, a bit of fuel, uh, you know, the foam breaking off. I'm not going to show you footage of that one. That's just too sad to be believed. A bit of foam breaking off and smashing into something. Foam had been smashing into it, takeoff after takeoff. And the engineers had known that it was happening. And there was a, a protocol in force in NASA saying, we can't keep taking off until we resolve this problem with the foam. But that bureaucrats kept saying, take off, take off, take off. And somewhere, someone was signing off saying it was okay to take off. And that, that morning, there'd been a problem with foam, and they were known they weren't supposed to take off, and they still took off in face. You know, it's just like breaking all the safety rules and just bizarre. Okay, so basically, as a professional, sure they might want to take off today, and sure the president might look bad if they don't take off today, and sure there's a lot of pressure on you to sign the form saying, yeah, it's okay to take off today. But you're a professional. Your duty is not to the president, and it's not to NASA, even if they're your employee. Your duty is to the people on that spaceship and the people that will be affected by that spaceship. It's just society in general. A friend of mine at this uni, one of the other teachers, does safety inspections. And he tells me these horrible stories of, about amusement park rides. And, 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 and uh, you know those little carnival rides you get on and terrible accidents. And one accident he was telling me about was um, uh, something out of the city. Apparently they don't get safety checked so often out of the city. The, 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 the rides come into the city, they have to be checked. So a lot of the bodgy ones just tour around around the country fairs, never coming into the city. And uh, uh, they, uh, they have to get a structural engineer to sign them off when they set up. And some, uh, and this one died, a crack, some bolt failed and some kids died on it. And they got the structural engineer's re report. And he was like this 90-year-old man. And he signed off saying it was safe. And he said he didn't physically inspect it. He was 90, like he was so proud he couldn't do it. To inspect it, he had to climb all over it. He'd obviously just, it was just a sinecure thing. It was just like he was signing forms and yeah, 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 getting the money. And he was a structural engineer. He was failing his professional duty. Um, 
So uh, there are uh, lots of examples, sadly, of people doing that. And possibly, I think, it's because people just don't think about it or don't know about it. So your duty, when you go out as a programmer or as any sort of professional, is to do the right thing, which means to write decent software. Now, you might say, OK, that was a bridge. That was an amusement park ride. That was a space shuttle. It's clear that if something goes wrong with those, it's bad things. But who cares if something goes wrong with a spreadsheet or you know, an alarm clock application or a, a word processor or iTunes? You know, that's not going to affect the world. So my duty isn't exactly the same. Uh, to which I would say, well, what am I going to say? You tell me. Worst case scenario means? Uh, well, okay. I, I guess that's sort of the answer I was looking for. Um, I wasn't thinking of being sued so much, but uh, that's right. Essentially, you're producing a component that's used in a chain. And you don't really know the net result of that chain. <coughs> now, maybe that alarm clock's being used for something important. Maybe that little piece of software you're writing is going to be embedded in a bigger system, and it's going to be controlling something bigger you don't know. Like a missile or whatever. <laughs> classic example is the Therac. Can I just finish by talking about the Therac 25? Who knows about the Therac? French piece of radiation equipment used for radiational diagnostic things. Um, it had two ways of operating. One was it sent a low intensity electron beam into you to scan you. The other one it used a super high electron beam with millions and millions of gigabits. Um, blasting, blasting. Now, so that that didn't burn a hole in you, all these like physical things came down. A big um, lens came down and dispersed it, and all these blocks came in and shook it round, and all this stuff. So that big, deadly beam was never blasted at you for too long. But the Therac 25 grew out of the Therac 6, which the French government had done. Maybe it was a joint thing with Canadians. I can't remember. Anyway, some government thing with lots of safety, lots of standards, very expensive to make, lots of serious engineers doing the right thing. But the government decided to privatise it and spin it off. Uh, somewhere between, I think the Therac 20 might have been. I don't know if the Therac 20 was that spun off the Therac 25. But anyway, at some point it was some private company doing it now. And they started to cut a few corners. And they realised that a lot of the um, safety features weren't needed. Uh, uh, well, well, what were the... I mean, it failed for multiple reasons. You can read all about them on the internet. But essentially what happened, the terrible story that actually... I have a video, but I can't even show you because it actually, actually breaks me up to watch a video. Is that people went in to be scanned by the Therac 25 and were because of a software error, in low intensity mode, it actually flipped into high intensity mode, and the uh, mechanical things didn't come down, so these people got blasted by 10 times the amount of radiation. Uh, uh, intensity. And um, there are people strapped in screaming and screaming, and uh, all sorts of things, and the company, of course, kept denying anything was going wrong. It only happened rarely, does it remind you of mudflap errors? It was actually due to a whole lot of things very similar to mudflap errors, errors that only occur sometimes under certain conditions. For example, the operator had to be going fairly quick, there was a couple of race conditions in there. So when the operators were starting to use the machine, it was okay, because they weren't very fast. But as they got better and better at using the machine, the user interface, they were sending data from the user interface more quickly. And it was something like some illegal stroke of keystrokes when you're turning on the machine, flipped it into some crazy illegal mode. There was some counter they kept increasing, and they never checked if it overflowed. There was all sorts of bits. They used lots of the software from the Therac 20, which made sense then. And they put it in the Therac 25, which lacked some of the features of the Therac 20. And some of the flaws in the software, which were quite safe in the Therac 20, became deadly in the Therac 25. Now, the thing is, when you write your code, you don't know. It's going to be moved later on to some other system and some other system and some other system. And it might be completely safe in the system you're in now, but the use of that code later on can have devastating effects. Now, you should read about the Therac because it's such a classic software failure. It fails for all sorts of reasons that you will personally recognize having just done the project. Um, so yeah, you should read about the Therac 25. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is you have a duty to do the right thing. I know I rant a lot about writing good code, about if it's not correct, it's not correct, make it correct. I sell this stuff, and you might be thinking we can cut corners, near enough, good enough, and so on, and so on, and so on. I just want you to think, maybe sometimes near enough is good enough, but you've got to be bloody sure that it is. And your job as a professional is not just to accept what someone tells you. Your job as a professional, as a duty to your profession, is to make sure you do the right thing. Um, okay, so, that's sort of all I wanted to say about professionalism. And uh, now I think we can do lecture four. Does anyone? Oh, I did have an ethics thing I wanted to show you. Just a very funny Morgan poll. Oh, you can't see the screen, but it's very funny. Let me put it up so you can. Uh, this is just, Morgan apparently has done this survey for a long time. I couldn't find any more recent data. I think the last one was only 2005. Yeah. Yeah, JP Moore. 
Uh, not Morgan Freeman. Did I say Morgan Freeman? No, you said Morgan. Oh, yeah, Morgan Paul. So Morgan Paul, Australian mm -hmm. pollster that polls various things up to 2005. He asked people, do you think which professions have a high, um, how would you rate the ethics and honesty of various professions? And he lists here the percentage of people that say high or very high for various professions. It's in decreasing order. So this is how the public perceives various professions. Nurses are at the top. Look at that, 86%. 90%, 89%. Pharmacists, people trust their pharmacists. Doctors, school teachers, engineers, I'm really pleased to see. 50% of people, 60%. Yeah, and university lecturers are down there. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's interesting to notice is an increasing amount of trust over time. And I think I've noticed that too, that society has become much more trusting the days of the 70s, everyone was cynical and sceptical, and now we're much more trusting. So people trust people. Look at that, there's just a general increase of more trust in people. Except for politicians, interestingly. Uh, engineers, dentists, police. So basically, these are all people who are helped by other people. And I guess that's a self-selecting thing. People who go into those careers, you sort of trust them. Super State, Supreme Court judges, High Court judges. That's sad. It's it's a low. University lecturers, look at that. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> Look, two thirds of people still think we're ethical, though. We've managed, we're very good at tricking people. No one trusts us. Priests? Oh, you're ministers of religion? Uh, yeah, they're down. Yeah. Uh, no, they're Jesus said it. 
Muhammad has it. Everyone's got it. The golden rule is essentially love other people as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So, yeah, treat others like yourself. You know, so look up, respect other people. You're selfless, other people more. Uh, yeah, you look up happiness research, you'll find 50 million bits and whack it on the thing. There's, it's all the time that people do it. In fact, there was a funny study they did in Holland, which I often use in my security course, which is they gave people money. And they said, that in four categories, they, some people they just gave the money. And they said, you must return this money. And if you don't, all these dire things will happen to you. And here's how we'll track you down. And here's how we'll know. And you must do it. And do it by this date. And they gave it to some other people and said, here's some money. Um, no, we'll probably know if you don't hand it back, so you should. And they sort of made them coerce them a bit to give it back. And then the third group, they just gave them some money and said, oh, can you give us this back in a couple of weeks? Guess where they got the money back from? Wow. Yeah. The more they tried to force people to give the money back, the less money they got back. And, and that sort of makes sense to me. In one of them, you're not treating the people as, with respect. You know, you're just sort of, you know, you're treating them like criminals. They're going to act like criminals. The other one, you, you're trusting people, and they will rise to that trust. And certainly I find that in teaching. If I have high expectations of you guys, or if I trust you, never has my trust ever been let down. And never have students not risen to that level of trust. Whereas if a lecturer says, the students are stupid, they're not going to get it, they'll do this, they'll cheat, they'll do all this bad stuff, then yeah, sure, the students probably will. And who spots that? So I think, uh, yeah, having high regard and high expectations for other people is a good thing to do. But we're, we're diverging a bit now. But of course, we are in an extension lecture, so we'll have to look better. But here's what I wanted to talk about in today's extension lecture. Oh, oh, sorry. Last bit of advice for when you're a professional. Jerry Madden, the, one of the um, dudes who used to run stuff at NASA, a project manager who was very effective, did put out a list of golden rules if you ever have to manage a project. I suggest you click on that and read those golden rules. It's really good advice for how to manage a team of people, how to do group work, and how to make things work. Does everyone see that link? You should absolutely check that out. Now, we've finally got to something that I've wanted to talk about for a long time which is war, torture, and revenge. Which is, what is a good programmer and the national anthem? Oh, actually, before we say that, I have a book I want to show you about what is a good programmer by Henri Cartier-Bresson. But before I show you that, we're just talking about ethics and helping other people. Has anyone seen this incredible film called Groundhog Day? Yes. Yes. Is it just the most awesome film ever? Made you cry. Because if you haven't seen the film, it's a film where it's got a basic steganographic message where the film itself never actually says what the film's about, which is, I think, quite nice. But in this film, this guy gets to live the same day over and over again. And I think as you go through life, you think on any given day you don't have many choices and everything's sort of fixed. And yet, the brilliant of the people that wrote the script for this film is that Every day, he just lives his same day over and over and over and over and over. And you think there's no way the day could be different next time. And every time the day happens, it's completely different. And you think, wow, how could you change the day? He... So for me, message number one is, you have all these choices on any one day. You think you're running to do, you know, he thinks, oh, since I go wake up, I've got to do a stupid talk, I've got to be on the radio, have lunch, get in the car, I'm stuck in the car and there's a snowstorm, I can't go anywhere. I'm so constrained today, I have no time to do anything. Yet you see him living that same day over and over again and making different choices every day. So, but without any commentary on it, really, from the, the only commentary, really, that ever happens in the whole film from the director is at one point he lives a day and it finishes and he gets to move on to the next day. So without commenting on that as to why that day he was able to finish and move on, that's the only value judgment you sort of ever get from the director. So it's a very nice, subtle film. So essentially this guy is a real dick and he lives his life for himself every day. And he's just thinking of other people and he's really rude. And he's not thinking of other people, he's rude. He's just thinking of his own troubles all the time. He lives his day, and, he, and it's a crap day, and then he wakes up and the next morning, it's the same day. And he lives the day again, it's a crap day, and he's ruder to people, and he discovers he can do anything, and he'll wake up the next day, so he you know, kills people, and he wakes up the next day, he's free. Uh, kills himself several times, he just eats food all the time, <laughs> doesn't worry about his, uh, you know, his fitness or anything like that. So, so he lives, but after a while he gets really bored, he spends like six months just learning how to flip cards. He just, you know, this thing goes on for years, he's just stuck in the same day forever. And then, at one point in the film, he suddenly gets this idea, he, he's wondering why he likes Andy McDowell so much, which is a really good question. Um, and he suddenly thinks, I like Andy McDowell because she's always looking after other people and helping other people. And it's like this revelation that comes to him, he thinks, wow, I'm living this same day over and over again, and every day I have all these choices, and I waste the day. Every day I just live for myself. 
and never live it for other people. So he then starts doing things to help other people, and he slowly lives his day over and over again until finally he lives the perfect day, where it's essentially selfless. He's just doing things to help other people. And then it's like some God says, okay, cha-ching, you got the message, and you move on. And he transformed, and he comes out, and he's a happier person. Oh, of course, it's not real film, but I just think, ooh, 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 that's a nice sort of summary of, uh, of my approach to heaven. Groundhog Day. Awesome film. Uh, so, we come to the question now, which has been asked over and over again. What is a good programmer? And Max, wave at me, Max. What are you question? Max asked... Is being a good pro essentially you are, is being a good programmer someone who writes just neat code and has lots of comments? Is that what it takes to be a good programmer? Uh, to which I, I said, well, no, I don't think that has anything to do with being a good programmer. That might be a consequence of being a good programmer, but I don't think that's the cause of being a good programmer. And then Max said, well, so what is being a good programmer? So what do you guys think? What is being a good programmer? What is it to be a good programmer? Write elegant code? Yes, I think a good programmer will write elegant code, but I don't think that's my definition of a good programmer. But I think that's a consequence of being a good programmer. Being an ethical professional? Being an ethical professional? Uh, I think being an ethical professional makes you a good person, but it doesn't necessarily make you a good programmer. Making something really complicated seem really simple. Making something complicated seem really simple. Oh, yeah, that's, that's sounding good. That's sounding really good. Uh, someone who writes code in the way it will be most useful. Someone who writes code in the way it will be most useful. This is sounding excellent. Yes. Somebody who solves problems. Someone who solves problems. Yes, yes. This is someone who writes code that no one has to go back and fix. Someone that writes code that no one has to go back and fix. I need to meet that person. Call that guy. Yeah, call that guy. Well, uh, well uh, I think he even sent someone down. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think being a good programmer is the art of being good any, which is you solve the problem and you solve it the best way it can be solved, and you solve the right problem. <laughs> so I think this is sort of all jobs, which are interesting jobs. I like this. And the easiest mistake is you brilliantly solve a problem, but it's not the right problem. Thank you. So, as a programmer, you go along and you get given a problem. And someone will tell you what they think the problem is. And they will have a good idea about some of the aspects of the problem. But there's a lot about the problem they won't know. And a good programmer is one that sits down, like a good spaceship designer, a good space shuttle designer, is one that solves the problem. What is the problem of the space shuttle? Well, it's got to get us from A to B. It can't cost too much, and it can't explode. It's got to be safe. And it's got to not only just be safe most of the time, it's got to be safe even when people stuff up, because people will stuff up. So the right designer of a space shuttle will sit down and will work out what they really need the space shuttle to do, and that will solve that problem. That is exactly the same as the right designer for a good program. I have a friend who was very smart at school. He's the smart, one of the smartest people I've ever met. I want to say the smartest ever, but I've met so many smart people since. Who knows? He's certainly astonishingly smart. He came first in everything he ever did. He worked out, I remember, he worked out polynomial division. We were both looking at a maths book in the library, and we were so bored with maths, we said, let's look at next year's maths book, and maybe we can work out some maths. And there was, it was Coronius, and there was this one little page, where Coronius, I taught his daughter once. He talked with my grandpa once. And, or his niece, or I taught, I taught someone that was related to him and I was slagging him and she came up after and said, he's my dad, uh, But anyway, so I was looking at a little bit of Coronius and there was this like one little paragraph on polynomial division. I go, what? 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 Ah! I was in year eight or something, it didn't make any sense. And we just looked at it, ah! And we both looked at it for a while and said, ah! And then we went home and that night he rang out and said, I've worked it out! And it actually worked out just from a few clues in this crappy one example that wasn't it was assuming you already knew it, wasn't explaining it. He worked out how poor. He was so smart. He could have done anything. He was a brilliant writer. He's a brilliant painter. He never gives up. He never sleeps. He's a brilliant mathematician. He's a brilliant chess player. So, <laughs> and he, he went to uni and he got like the highest mark in the universe. He went to uni and he did law. 
because that's what you could do with a high smoking university. His love was art and literature and history, so he did a combined law arts degree. He learned all about philosophy and psychology and the medieval period, which he loves, and all this great philosophy and great stuff. And at the same time, he's blitzing law, coming first in everything, got offered a summer clerkship at the most prestigious law firm. Uh, he was snapped up straight away as a graduate in the most prestigious law firm. He got promoted so fast, he was senior associate before anyone else in his year, or probably even a year above him, senior associate. He was partner before anyone had ever been a partner before. In the recent who's who of top lawyers in like the whole known universe ever, I looked it up, and there he was as being really good at what he does, something to do with money and stuff. And, and, and he's just so, every time he sneezes, he drops money everywhere, he's just so <laughs> and, and he works in this office that looks like, like a medieval cathedral laced with gold, and it's just like you walk into the foyer and it's marble, and it's just like wealth and opulence and prestige, and whenever he wants anything, he just goes and gets it. And he wants to see a cricket game in some other country, he just flies there rather than watching it on his enormous TV. He's just, he's just so he's fabulously successful. And I thought, you know what's going to happen is, and, and when I see him, he's never happy. And he's looking really unhealthy, and he's looking really unwell, and he's, he's sort of bored, and he never does anything interesting. And I haven't heard him laugh. We used to spend all our high school time laughing. I haven't heard him laugh for ages. And he always says negative, sarcastic things now. He's very interested in money and status and success. And he's just, and whenever you ring him, there's no point to ring him at home. He's always at the office. Sunday, Mother's Day, Christmas, you ring him, he's at the office doing something for some client, and he's getting paid millions of He's just, his whole life's there. And I just thought, gee, at the end of his life, he's like going to get to the end of his life, and I hope he never watches this video, and he's going to get to the end of the life, and he's going to think, look at that path I went on, the path of being a, a money lawyer. I went further on that path than anyone has ever gone. I am the best money lawyer in the universe. I am better for my clients at lawyering their money than any other person could be. I am the best in the world. I have completely and utterly succeeded. I have gone further on this path than anyone could possibly go. But I can't help but think I'm on the wrong path. And I've gone so far doing all this stuff, and I've had a shit life, and I haven't got any kids, and I haven't found love, and I haven't found happiness, and me, the 15 seeing me now, would just be, think I was a parody of myself, and, and would be so disappointed I could be doing this. And it, it, I think in some sense, when we're trying to solve a problem, if you're just an obsessive person like me, you just do everything you can to solve that problem. But I think a really good person steps back and says, is this the right problem to solve? No. Well, I think we go step by step, towards the wrong path, and every step seems to make sense. And I think a really good programmer is someone who takes a step back. So, you know, for the first task we did, remember I talked about the first task when we did Beyond? What was the real problem with Beyond? I think the real problem with Beyond was, as I told you, the difficulty in detecting errors. I don't think that's always the biggest difficulty, but that's what I think the problem with that one was. And I think you could be a brilliant programmer and write the world's best Beyond program, and you could write the world's smallest Beyond program, but I think you'd sort of be missing the main point of the Beyond program. Is there a hand there? Yeah. Are you a hand or just crushing your head? The second assignment? Well, look, every assignment's been about a different thing. But in every assignment, none of them have been about the technical things. I don't really care how you go with the technical stuff. As long as you're in there struggling away and having errors and compiling and solving some of them, then you're progressing with your programming, and I'm proud of you. I don't expect anyone to solve all the technical problems. And those who could already problem could probably already solve all the technical problems straight away. But it's very rarely the technical problem that's the real problem. If you ever do my security course, you'll see that. People put enormous effort into building unbreakable locks and putting them on their front doors. But the back door's open. <laughs> the security course, it is just so standard, it's not even funny if you stop laughing at it. People always defend the wrong thing. And they defend them perfectly, but they're defending the wrong thing. They're putting so much stuff in the lockdown password system so no one can get to their hard disk drive and get the stuff, but someone can walk in off the street and lift the computer up and walk out with it. No one does. <laughs> so, so you just, I think the classic human problem is you're given a problem and you try and solve it, and you never take a step back saying, but is this the right problem to be solving? So I think a master programmer, the world's best programmer, is one that when they see a problem, they look at it and they work out what the, what the real problem is. Now, how come after doing this course, you've got a bigger glimpse of what the real problem is? Because the real problem always has a couple of common attributes in it. One of the things about the real problem, is sort of coming up to what you were saying, is 
your code, when you write it, your biggest limitation is going to be the errors that you generate yourself. And you're going to be thinking about all the tricky, clever things. How many people thought of hundreds of tricky, clever things for their players to do? You probably just, let's say, they're lying and basking and dreaming about all the complex things you've got to get your player to do. But you couldn't get a working player at all, so it's just wasted. Can you see that? I think the biggest obstacle we face, we call it the adversary, but I think the adversary is us. The biggest problem we face when we program is we generate too many errors. So I think, number one, a master programmer realizes I am going to be the source of a lot of my own problems. So I had better write my programs in such a way that if they have bugs in them, the bugs are self-evident. So hence, I will write clean code. And I am going to assume that my code will later be read by other people because part of every software system is the software that gets passed on, even though you don't know about it. Hence, I will put lots of comments in and make my code really clear, even if I think I understand it, or I know that I myself will forget it. And I realize that this is going to be used with large amounts of data at some point, so it's really important to get the algorithm right. And I realize this is never going to be used with large amounts of data, so it doesn't matter if this algorithm is memory wasteful. So the master programmer doesn't always think, I'm after the shortest, tersest, most memory efficient, fastest program. They solve the right problem. Sometimes the oh, classic example, Hamming code. You know how I learned Hamming codes at university? It was in my first computing course in our second assignment. And in the first assignment, oh no, in my second computing course, in our second assignment. In my first assignment, I'd done really well. And the lecturer had, had said, Wow, Richard, you did really well. I was so proud. And I thought, I'm going to do really well in the second assignment too. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to race the lecturer. And, and he said, I said, and we had a challenge with him. I don't know who proposed it, him or me. And it was to see who could do it the fastest. So given a file of, num of bits and using, we had to do it in machine code, I was going to write the fastest bit of machine code to convert that whole file into Hamming encoded machine code. And I... I Stop sleeping. And I went through the machine code set and I thought all the little tricks I could do. And I had a 17 byte program and I changed it and I got it down to a 13 byte program in step by step. And my friends couldn't believe it because they're still on 18 and 17 byte programs. And I got it down to a 30 byte program. I couldn't believe it. And then slowly my friends started over time because I did this early on, started catching up. And one got to a 15 byte program and I thought, ah, ah. And then I thought this whole new way of thinking about Hamming code and this whole new approach that almost violated the spec of what a Hamming code was. And I, I did it this radical way because technically it complied with the spec. And I got it down to 10 bytes. And I thought, ah, I spent like 100 man hours on this problem. It's got to be the smallest bit of machine code ever. You know, I'm, I'm so going to blitz it. And I put it into the competition. And the lecturer absolutely crapped on me. His bit of code went boom. And his was more than 10 times faster than mine. And he said, oh, I said, how long did it take you to write your program? He said, oh, I wrote it in about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I did this optimization with it. He said, oh, that's very clever. Wow, yeah, I'd never have thought of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> ah! And do you know how he wrote his program work? I'll tell you the world's fastest Hamming code decoder. It's a lesson I've never learned. Never not learned. Never learned. <laughs> I said, I learned. Too late. He wrote a simple loop program that generated the Hamming code for every single possible input. You're encoding an 8-bit number. How many 8-bit numbers are there? How many 8-bit numbers are there? 256. I think we were doing it on 16-bit numbers, so maybe it was 65,000. So you wrote a loop and generated an enormous table with the correct Hamming code for every possible input. So his program was like hundreds of K long in machine code. Because it generated this huge, enormous table that had the correct Hamming code for every single input. And his program to decode the Hamming code was one operation. It was take the Hamming code, use that as an index into this array, print out the value in the array. <laughs> <laughs> Recomputed the whole thing. And there I was thinking the objective was to make the program small. And sure, small sometimes is faster. But what was the real problem? To be fast. He made it fast and he made it big. So I solved the wrong, wrong problem. And I've never forgotten that. So I think the art of being a good programmer is you have to be in this like zen-like state. You don't have any assumptions about what's going on. You look at the problem and you see what the real problem is. And your client won't care whether the code's readable or not, because they don't know that part of the problem. But that is part of the problem, because you're not going to be able to write good code if it's too complex. And your client's not going to know about testing, but you yourself hopefully now know. If you don't test, everything you write's going to be riddled with crap. If you don't test, 
and get rid of the crap as it accumulates, as it goes, it will accumulate at like tartar in your teeth and you'll never get it off. You've got to brush your teeth every day to get it clean. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I have here to show you what I regard as my Bible for good programming. And it's a book by, of photos by Henri Cartier-Bresson. Now, who's heard of Cartier-Bresson? Anyone that knows photography has probably seen him or knows him, even if you don't remember his name. Cartier-Bresson is, I believe, the best photographer in the known universe. Known to me. My known universe. I decided I would buy a camera and I would take beautiful photos. I bought an expensive camera. And I thought, now I have an expensive SLR with a depth of field adjustment on it, I would be able to take beautiful professional photos. And I took my first set of photos and I looked at them and instead of the crap ones from my old crap camera, I now have a set of crap ones from my new expensive camera. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, wow, maybe it's not the technology that's going to make the difference to me being a good programmer or not. Maybe it's me. And so I sat down, because I'm a scientist. Whenever I'm faced with a problem, I begin to investigate. So I asked all my friends what they thought were good and bad photos. I started cutting out photos from the paper and rating them and saying what I thought of them. I read every photography book I could see. I showed my work to every photography professional I could find and asked for critiques. And I just looked and looked and looked and tried to work out what the magic was to make a photo, a beautiful photo. Now, it's an open-ended problem because a photo, you can take a photo of anything. But it's a rectangle. Essentially, it's a selection problem. You're selecting a rectangle of reality to capture in your photo. And you can select this one or you can select that one. And they might look the same, but a brilliant photographer will select this one and a crap photographer will select this one. <laughs> or click the button once per second later or just some slight difference. Henri Cartier-Bresson is such a legend. I can't believe it. When I first saw his photos, it actually stopped me taking photos for a while. <laughs> I'm just so humble. I just thought, oh... Oh, I could never take a photo like that. My photos are so crap. And I think it's part of being a good programmer. Do you think so? The more, hopefully as a result of being in this course, you, your programming might have even gone backwards. Is that the case? My photography did. The more you learn, the more you realize how crap you are. Sometimes your critical ability develops faster than your creative ability. But that's okay, because you've got the incentive there to improve. So I really did stop taking photos. And then I heard this story about David Moore, who's a uh, really cool Australian photographer. He did those really nice Harbour Bridge photos all the time. And he said he was at some Venice thing, taking a photo on some cathedral steps or something. And he was like lining it up and he could see the sun was going to be in the right spot in a minute. There was a nice cloud just about to pass and there were some kids walking down the street. And he started to get this sense that you sometimes get, ah, oh, a photo is building. There will be a magic moment soon. I need to catch that magic moment. And he's setting it up and he's getting the light right and the shadows right and he's working out the exposure. And he's just trying to get it right. And suddenly there's someone right next to him, jostling him. He's being cross. What? Some bastard's next to me. He's just about to take the world to his photo. He goes, oh! It's Cartier Brisson. Oh, oh, when I'm taking this photo, I'm going to talk to him and tell him how much I love him and everything. So, 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 take somebody, look, he's gone. Mm -hmm. So, like, David Moore was there for like five minutes to try and take this perfect photo. Cartier Brisson walks up, takes a photo, go. <laughs> and you just know, no matter how good David Moore is, that Cartier Brisson's photo was just, oh. And, and he disappeared during the war, and people thought he was dead. It was just really funny. And then they were having this uh, retrospective of his work in some big gallery, and he turned up to him. <laughs> he is just the most amazing man. Now, uh, let me, I just got to show you randomly some of these photos. Uh, so, let me say that to me, being a photographer is the same as being a good computer programmer, which is I constantly strive to improve. I'm constantly aware of my shortcomings. I'm very critical of everything I produce. Nothing I produce is ever clear enough, is ever simple enough is ever beautiful enough to be right, and I'm constantly critical, but I'm not depressed, I'm happy. But I'm always striving to improve, and I'm always looking at others, and trying to learn from others, and see what they've done. Cartier Brisson, oh, well, okay, let's just take some. Random photos. I don't think they're going to come out well. He takes them right to the frame, you see the black around the edge? He's actually, he's not cropping, he's not doing any of that fancy stuff we do. He uses one camera, one lens, one sort of film, and he prints to the edge of it. Now, some of his photos are just, just, just oh, those India photos. Oh, wow. uh, let me, oh, I'm so excited I can't find any to show you, so let me just find some. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's called the moment. He, he really believes in capturing the moment. He doesn't set up fake shots. He's not like... Um, like Ansel Adams, a famous American photographer who knows all about this. Ansel Adams is like a geek. 
He knows all about photography and frames and exposures and levels and things like that. He plans his photos with calculators and computer programs and he's built elaborate labs and he, his programs, are, he, Ansel Adams' photos are always technically perfect. Patrick Brisson's photos aren't always technically perfect. They're close to But Ansel Adams just gets exposures right and he invented the zone system. He's just awesome. But his photos just always leave me cold. I look at his photos and say, ah, yeah, yeah, it's a cloud. Oh, it's a building. Whereas Cathy Brisson, for me, captures something about humanity. So, uh, where's some of those? There was a photo of his, oh, wow. There was a photo of his um, portraits recently at the National Portrait Gallery, and I went down and looked, and they were just so perfect. I just want to show you perfect ones. Now, oh, this is, a, I love this one. Have I shown you that one already? Um, I guess if you're not a photographer, you just think, oh, yeah, it's a nice photo. Um, oh, here's one in India of people drawing the clocks. Oh, you can't really see them. I can't really show you. Somehow, what he does is he plots the journey that your eye takes across the photo by using lights and darks and shadows. He actually knows the journey your eye will take. He puts parallels and repeated themes in. Often he's commenting on one thing, and he uses this repeated theme to sort of subtly suggest what he's actually saying. Sometimes you can't even work out what he's saying. And sometimes what he's saying is just so beautiful and moving. He captures humanity. So his photos are true. They have this ring of truth about them. So when you watch him, you think, oh, yes, that is what an old man is like. A friend of mine wanted to take a photo of Parramatta Road one day. He said, I just need a shot of Parramatta Road that says, you know, this is Parramatta Road. You know, the, the shot of Parramatta Road. So it captures the essence of Parramatta Road. And he and I took the camera. And we spent the whole day going up and down Parramatta Road, trying to catch a rectangle that was Parramatta Road. And we couldn't get any photo that when we looked at it at the end said, oh, that's Paramount Road! Whereas every one of Cartier Brisson's photos, if it's an old lady being sad because her boy is going off to school and you're thinking he's growing up and leaving and he's stepping into the bus and talking to his friends and there's just the look of her face and him getting in the bus and it's a hot day and you get a sense that they're poor and you wonder if maybe she's hoping he's going to go off and get an education and become a doctor and, and he captures this whole thing in a photo and you look at it and you go, oh, oh, that's really... And then finally it would just be, oh, there's a kid getting in a bus. Oh, old lady's head got in the way. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, I don't think this is possibly the best way of showing you just flip. Oh, look at this! Oh, I think that's Gandhi. Is that Gandhi? Is that when? I think maybe when Gandhi was speaking. I can't remember all the Indian stories. That's just a whole lot of people. <coughs> can't remember. Yes. Uh, I, I should have. Uh, look, I'll just leave this book here. If anyone wants to see it, you can watch it. But for me, finding the perfect photo is like writing the perfect program. I can't tell you what it is, but you'll know it when you see it. You'll never see it but you'll strive for it and get a great sense of joy and pleasure as you get closer to it. Oh, and National Anthem? Yeah. National Anthem's another thing. Uh, uh, all I wanted to say about National Anthem's was this. That, oh yeah, Leo and John Paul got the answer. Where are you guys? Do you want to stand up? Leo's here, Leo's here, well done. Is it John Paul? Is that? He's got it. Oh, okay. Oh, don't say what it is, though, Theo. Well done. Theo got it. Well, why are we talking about national anthems? Why do we talk about flags? Because if you listen to national anthems, any national anthem, except perhaps the French one, the German one, they're all about victory and fighting and triumph and God saving his people and going victorious into battle and rockets exploding and guns and how glorious our country is. But the only example of that is the counter example, which is really nice, is the German uh, uh, national anthem, Neune Neune Luftflug. So I don't know if anyone's heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. That's actually an anti-war national anthem. Uh, and, and the Australian national anthem, which is about nothing, which is also nice. Right? But they're all about patriotism and flags, and patriotism and nationalism. It's this big movement that swept the world since about the 1800s. Why does that have to do with programming? Patriotism and nationalism is about I will go and fight for my country, and that's why we have national anthems and flags, to stir up the swell of patriotism. I will go fight for my country and kill people I don't know and have no personal grudge against. I will go and do that because it's the right thing to do, because it's my country, and I will not question it. I'm really interested in this notion of things we do to get us to do acts which we don't question. And I think a good program, and I see it on the forums here, questions everything. And if I tell you guys, write clean code, and you think, I will write clean code because Richard told me, and I like Richard. You are an idiot. <laughs> and if you're the person that's constantly saying, I don't, why do I have to write clean code? I don't believe I should write clean code. 
You are a scholar. You must question everything. Don't believe what anyone says. So national anthem is to be the antithesis of what it is to be a scholar. So don't believe anything I say about writing tests, about writing clean code, about anything. Experiment, search, find yourself, question and criticise everything, and shout out what a load of rubbish whenever you think I'm saying something wrong. Because if you believe me, you'll believe the next person that comes along, and the next and the next, and then one of them will be telling you to fly a plane into a building, and that'll just be, you know, make no sense. <laughs> so, so for me, being a good programmer is not believing anything, not taking anything for granted, questioning everything, being a sceptical bastard, and constantly trying to do the right thing. What's that? Yeah, why are you listening to me? I tricked you. <laughs> okay. All right, next week we're going to talk about this now and wrap up.